Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. He is risen. Thank you. Just uh, want to take a, a moment um, to uh, say thank you to those of you who have provided uh, furniture for us to live in in the Parsonage and uh, help to make us feel homey and welcome, and, and we want to thank you for that. And uh, you've been very great, and uh, Pat and I want to both thank you. I was sitting up front. My wife was sitting in the back. We still are uh, getting along, but uh, she uh, had surgery on her neck a few years back, and, and so she has to sit back farther so her head is not bothered. Otherwise, she'll get a headache. And so anyhow, that's how we deal with it. So I uh, just want you to be aware that uh, we are in good shape in our marriage. So <laughs> anyhow, the, uh, I wanted to make kind of a brief announcement uh, and kind of kick it off, especially on this Resurrection Day, is that uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll be starting a class uh, at 9.15 on Sunday mornings called The Seven Laws of the Learner. And it's an excellent class, and if you've ever wanted to teach, uh, and many of us teach in different levels, and uh, teach your kids, and uh, teach uh, maybe in your workplace, teach in a Sunday school class or somewhere, and uh, Bruce Wilkerson has done a wonderful DVD, DVD series called The Seven Laws of the Learner, and so we're we're going to kick that off here in a few weeks. So I just want to get my plug in for that. I want to start out by sharing, and this is a preface to what, uh, what I'm going to be sharing in the message. Uh, why, I'm here as the fill-in pastor, as the interim pastor, uh, and uh, so I'm sort of holding down the fort until you get a full-time pastor here. And uh, so my name is Ken, and, and my last name is Woodski. And f two months ago, when I spoke here, I shared that an easy way to remember my last name is my wife's little jingle, I would ski if I could ski, but I can't ski, so I won't ski, <laughs> would ski. So Ken and Pat, and uh, just introducing ourselves once again. It's been great to get to know you all. Now, why, why am I here? Believe it or not, I'm going to have a birthday this summer, and, and I'm going to be uh, an even number and, uh, on that birthday. And so why, why do I do what I do? In a sense, I'm retired, but, but I'm out of retirement right now. Years ago, someone said something to me that has always stuck in my mind, there are two things in this world that last forever. Now, I've thought about that over the years, and there are more than two things, but, but there are two things that last forever. Have you ever considered that? One is the Word of God. It says in Isaiah chapter 40, the grass withereth, the flower fades, but the Word of our God lasts forever. Okay? So... The word of God lasts forever. And then people last forever. And that's going to be more per se of what we're going to be looking at in the message this morning. But people last forever. If you, do, if you know Christ, if you've put your faith and trust in Christ, if you've come to the cross and admit it that you're a sinner and that you need a savior, you're born again. You're a child of the king. And when you die, you go to heaven. You last forever. You have eternal life. But sad to say, if you don't put your faith and trust in Christ, you last forever also. But you go to a different place. So there's the resurrection of life and the resurrection of eternal damnation. So years ago... I decided I wanted to invest my life in two things that last forever. I wanted to invest my life in the Word of God, and I wanted to invest my life in people. And that's what I do, why I do what I do. 
That's why I'm kind of retired, but not kind of retired. Why I keep going. Because I love people, I love God's word, and I am want to invest my days in those two things. Amen. Now, there are some important dates in history. And we know some of these very well. December the 7th, 1941, it was on a Sunday morning when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Now, is there anybody that remembers that? Raise your hand. I mean, you were here. You were living. You were, you were living and you remember it. Okay, well, there's a, boy, there's a couple. That's great. And then, of course, many of us remember the date, September 11, 2001. Yeah. Remember what we were doing. I was in a restaurant, and I was having breakfast with a couple that had visited our church in Montana on Resurrection Day that year. And they came back in September, and we were having breakfast with them, and they said, we came to your church on Resurrection Day, and we heard the gospel, and we placed our faith and trust in Christ. And she was 100% Jew, and it was wonderful to see the transformation in their lives. But that's what, so September 11th has kind of a double meeting for me, and, and we all do. And then, and then I threw one in there that uh, will make some of you scratch your head, and you'll say, uh, November the 9th, 1989. That was a significant day, folks. That was the day when the Berlin Wall fell. We, we don't think much about that, but, but you know, what does that tell us, folks? That tells us that communism doesn't work. We've been talking about the gospel this morning in our church. Uh, it was mentioned downstairs. Tim mentioned the gospel this morning. You know, the gospel is a wonderful, wonderful thing. The good news of Jesus Christ. And you know, my dad used to tell me, he, he loved physics, and my father used to tell me, there's no known force that can stop expansion and contraction. And he just used to say that all the time. But you know, I've changed that a little bit. There's nothing that can stop the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing can stop it. And although in America today, it seems like Christianity is on a, we're a post-Christian nation, but there are places across the world where people are coming to, still coming to Christ in a marvelous way because the gospel cannot be stopped. You know, Christianity is the largest faith in the world. Did you ever, did you ever think about that? It's the largest faith. Well, I, I don't want to say religion because Christianity isn't a religion. Some people would call it a religion, but I, I like to refer to Christianity as a faith in the living Christ, the living God, the eternal God. And so September 9th is significant in the sense that it tells us communism didn't, didn't work. And then I think the most significant day was around the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ literally changed the world. Changed the world. And there, and there are other dates on there, I think, that are really significant. October 31st, 1517, 500 years ago when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to, to the Wittenberg door. Man, that came and went in America this year and hardly anybody. I guess you guys talked about it here at the church, and I, my hat is off to you. It's very significant. The, the Reformation, and along with that, was the invention of the printing press. And we take it so for granted, this Bible we have in front of us now. But during the Dark Ages, they were starved for the Word of God, and that's what Martin Luther really did. And, in one sense, he, he began the, the fires of the Reformation. But he also gave the German people the Bible in their own language. Very significant. So there were significant days. Well, what's 
study? Why study the resurrection? Well, yeah, it gives us a hope for the future. It gives us a hope. Now, when I was young and I was full of vim and vitality, I didn't hope for the future as much as I do now. Especially when I do something physically and I have all kinds of aches and pains. But it gives us a hope and, and sometimes we just get discouraged with what's happening in the world and, and how humanistic the thinking has become in America today. But it gives us a hope. It's, and you know what? Peter tells us in, the, in, in 1 Peter that it's a living hope. It's a living hope. And it gives us peace about the future. We can know and have peace about the future. Jesus said, peace I give unto you. Peace. It gives us peace. It gives us a picture of what heaven will be like. The resurrection does. We have some incidences where Christ revealed himself in his resurrection body. And so it gives us a picture of what heaven will be like. And then it gives us a, a glimpse of the power of God. What is that? What is the power of God? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3, whatever things were gained to me, those things I counted as lost for the sake of Christ. And more than that, I count all things lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ. And then he goes on, and that I might know him in the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. That I might know him in the power of the resurrection. Dear friends, humanism can't transform lives. The power of the gospel and the power of the resurrection can transform lives. I know. Because I was headed in one direction when I was 17 years old. And Christ changed my life. I was a poor student, and I, and I came to Christ, and I've been studying ever since. He literally changed my life. The New Living Translation in the last verses, last five or six verses, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uses the word transformed. Transformed. And that's why we preach the gospel we preach is because it is the power to transform lives. And so we get a glimpse of the power of God in the resurrection and it gives us a forecast of the future. One of the questions that I've uh, been asked about over the years is, well, when, are, when, do, when does the resurrection take place? Well, there's some, uh, just some basicness here I want to share with you. There were some resurrections before Christ, some rising from the dead. Now, these people that were risen from the dead, they died again. Christ rose from the dead never to die again. And when you and I, when we put our faith and trust in the living Christ, we'll never die again. But the widow's son in the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 17, the Shumanite son, 2 Kings 4, the man who touched Elijah's bones, that's, that's a great little story. We're, gonna, we're not going to take time to read it this morning, but it's a great story. They dumped this guy into Elijah's grave and he came back to life. Amazing. It's an interesting thing that uh, it was Elijah and Moses that were with the Lord Jesus Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew chapter 17. And Elijah was the one that was taken, no that's Elijah, excuse me, Elijah was taken to heaven in the chariot of fire. Okay, in the New Testament, we have Jairus' daughter, uh, the boy of Nahum, and Lazarus in, in John chapter 11. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Now, here's something significant about 
John chapter 11, when Lazarus was raised, Jesus said these words, Lazarus, come forth. He didn't say the word simply, come forth. He called him by name. Why is that? Because Jesus, when he, if he would have said, come forth, all the, those in the graves would have come forth. Okay? So he, he specifically said his name. So there was some rising from the dead before Christ. Now, we, I have a little timeline here. Okay? There's the cross. Okay? The resurrection of Christ. There's the cross, and three days later... We know that Christ rose from the dead. As Tim shared with us on Good Friday, you can't separate the two. They're, they're united together. You can't have a resurrection without a cross. And you ha can't have a cross without a resurrection. They go hand in hand. But notice what it says. It goes back to what I had said earlier. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming... Now, here's something interesting. In Matthew 27, verse 52, and it's the only place in the four Gospels that is mentioned. When Christ rose, it says, and the graves were open. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Now, in the Old Testament, when you died... You went to a place called paradise. And that was, in a sense, a holding place. You remember the story in Luke chapter 16, the last part of, of Luke chapter 16, where the rich man and Lazarus died. And, and, and the rich man called down, called to Abraham and said, send Lazarus that he might give me a drink of water because I'm in torment. Well, Lazarus was in paradise, and the rich man was in Hades. But at the cross, when Christ rose, all those that were in paradise were taken to heaven. That's part of the first resurrection. Now, keep in mind this morning that there are two resurrections. There's the resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the unrighteous. And this is the first phase of the first resurrection. Christ rose from the dead. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And with that, he took the saints of the Old Testament with him. Okay? Then, in 1 Thessalonians, and I love that passage in 1 Thessalonians, and I'm going to read that to you this morning that says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. That's what Paul is saying. We want you to know what happens to those who have died. So you will not grieve like the people who have no hope. You will not grieve like the people who will have no hope. The resurrection gives us a hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. Okay? We tell you this directly from the Lord... We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a, with a commanding shout and the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And first the Christians who have died will raise from their graves and then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and we will be with the Lord forever. And then he adds something on this passage of scripture. So encourage each other with these words. That's what I want to do. I want to encourage you today. So there's the cross. And then what we call the church age. The church began in the book, in the book of Acts, chapter 2. The church began. We're in the age of grace. We're in the church age. Now, I believe that the next great event is going to be the rapture of the church, the taking up of the church. And this is what it's talking about, I believe, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, I realize that in a congregation this size, there are those of you maybe who don't believe in the rapture. Well, I have something for you today, okay? You know what? It doesn't matter. Okay? If you don't believe in a rapture, and I believe in a rapture, it doesn't ra really matter. You know why? Because Christ is going to do what Christ is going to do. Because Christ is in control. Now, is this something that I'm going to take a bullet over? You know, I'll take a bullet over the deity of Christ. I'll stand on the cross. I'll take a bullet for that. But whether there's going to be a rapture or not, I don't know. I think there is. I read the Bible literally, and, and that's what it says literally to me. So the next great thing I'm hoping for is, is the rapture of the church. Now somebody says, you know what my theological perspective is, is I have the pan theory. You know what the pan theory is? It'll all pan out in the end. And sometimes we get so carried away on some of these things and we want to cause division. Let's not cause division, folks. Okay? I believe the Bible is teaching here that those who have died will be caught up to meet Christ in the air, and then those who are alive will meet him in the air. And that's part of the resurrection. That's the second phase. Of, I call it the, the second phase of the resurrection. Okay? So we got the church, church age, and then the, the rapture, the coming of Christ. That's the second stage. And then if you believe, like I believe, that there's seven years of tribulation in the book of Revelation, and then at, that, at the end of that tribulation, Christ comes on his great white horse. He comes to conquer. And the saints that have lived through the seven years of tribulation will be raised. So this morning, what I'm the question I'm answering this morning is when? When is the resurrection taking place? And it's rather confusing. When will you be raised? Well, I think it's going to be at the time when Christ comes, at the advent of Christ. And so we've got the first stage, when Christ rose from the deck, dead the second stage, is when he came, it comes at the rapture, and the third stage is after the seven years of tribulation. Now, that's the resurrection of the righteous. What about the resurrection of the lost? I think in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20, gives us some insight to this. And actually, I'm going to Look at, beginning in verse 1, and we're, we're, we'll go through this chapter rather quickly. If you've got your Bibles, follow along with me. John says, And then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand, and he seized the dragon, the old serpent who was the devil, Satan, and he bound him in chains for a thousand years. And the angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut up and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations any longer. See, that's what's happening in the world today. Satan is the great deceiver. Until the thousand years were finished, and afterwards he must be released for a little time. And then I saw the thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. 
And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony about Jesus and proclaiming the word of God. And they had not worshipped the beast or the statue, nor accepted his mark on his forehead or or their hands. And they all came to life again. That's the third phase of the resurrection. Third stage. They all, those after the tribulation all came to life again. The resurrection. And they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, maybe you believe in a thousand year reign of Christ. Maybe you don't. I think it, it says a thousand years. I believe it. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Now here's the question for me. I'm an old farm boy. I, was grew, I grew up on a farm in North Dakota. I like farming. I don't, I don't like all the fixing in farming. And I don't like all the financial worries of farming. But I like farming. I like to see crops grow. It's just a wonderful thing for me. And so I asked myself over the years, Am I going to be able to live during this thousand-year reign of Christ? I'd like to, but somehow the theologians seem to think I won't. Anyhow, but that's all in God's hands. So, but it would be fun. It would be fun. It'd be fun to do it with a body that's not decrepit. A young body. You know, that'd be fun. It says here it's the first resurrection. And then we come to a, a, a very difficult passage. It's difficult in the sense because it's very sobering. Beginning in verse 7 of Revelation chapter 20. And when the thousand years had come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations, called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth, and he will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as the sand along the seashore. And then I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But the fire from heaven came down from on the attacking armies and consumed them. And then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophets, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. See, goes back to that thing, what lasts forever? Satan will last forever. People will last forever. It's where you spend eternity. And I saw a great white throne I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on it, which is Christ, and the earth and the sky fled from their presence, but they found no place to hide. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and then it says, and the books were opened including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Now, you know, folks, you've heard it. When you place your faith in the living Christ, when you come to the cross, your name is placed in the book of life. If you don't put your faith and trust in the living Christ, you're your deeds are put in the books of life. And Christ here judges from the books of life. And the sea gave up their dead, and the death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Now, folks, I want to make this very clear. 
When you come, when you die and you stand before Christ, if you've placed your faith and trust in the living Christ, you are not going to be judged like this. Why? Because Christ bore all your sins on the cross. Past, present, and future. And he says what? It is finished. It's done. He wiped the slate clean. But if you don't come to the cross, you will stand at the great white throne judgment and you will be judged. And death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Folks, I know it's unpopular to talk about hell and damnation. But that's the reality. And that's the blessed hope of the cross. We lost a great light in America. Billy Graham died. And we've watched a few things, a few videos that people have pay, uh, put on faith, Facebook. You might have done the same. Billy Graham always told people, you're a sinner, you need to come to the cross. That's the only way your life can be changed. That's the only hope you have. And millions of people's lives were changed across America. And we can't stop preaching that message. That's the gospel of hope. What does it say in, in Philippians 3.20? For my citizenship is in heaven, for which I eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of my humble state into conformity with his body by the exertion of his power that he has, bringing of the power of Christ. And we have that power available for us to live the Christian life. As Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I might know him in the power of the resurrection. Well, oh, I guess I have a concluding slide. Daniel 12.2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So just to recap, those raised before the cross die again. And the first resurrection has three stages. Christ, the rapture, and after the tribulation. And the last resurrection is for the unrighteous. And the question we must ask ourselves, which resurrection will we be in? And then, are you knowing Christ in the power of the resurrection? <laughs>